do what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello there. Well, today is St Andrew's Day, so what a day to talk Scotland. The SNP are trailing behind Labour in almost every poll now, and today the Alba Party have announced their plans to try and extend the powers of Scottish Parliament to allow them to legislate for and negotiate independence. So what is next? for Scotland and security sources have said a terror attack on the streets of the UK linked to the situation in Gaza is only a matter of time and meanwhile apparently half of British Jews have said that they've considered leaving the UK amid a staggering rise in discrimination towards them. So what uh, do we make to all of this now? The conflict in the Middle East really is affecting the streets of the UK. What is the answer to it all? And Lucy Letby, remember her? She was of course convicted for killing multiple babies of anyway she has now been moved to a prison which says its main aim is to i quote change lives for the better oh it sounds lovely nice cell tv phone and an ensuite is jail a little bit too cushy and an asian bbc presenter has described how working with mainly white people is affecting his mental health what do you make to that Yes, indeed, we've got all of that to come. I've got Aaron Bastani and Peter Hitchens alongside me tonight. But before we get stuck in, let's cross live to Aaron Armstrong for tonight's latest news headlines. A very good evening to you. Aaron Armstrong here in the GB newsroom. It's a minute past six. Uh, two more hostages have been released from Gaza in the latest uh, prisoner hostage swap between Hamas and Israel. In the last hour, the woman, a 21-year-old French dual national and a 40-year-old, are believed to have arrived at the Sheba Medical Centre in Tel Aviv. We're also expecting more captives held by Hamas to be released this evening, marking the seventh day of the current pause in fighting. Meanwhile, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has reiterated his belief that Israel will eradicate Hamas, the terror group, after it claimed responsibility for a shooting that killed three people in Jerusalem. At least eight others were injured in the attack. It took place at a bus stop during rush hour outside the entrance to the capital. Police say the two suspected attackers were neutralised on the spot by off-duty officers. Here in the UK, Matt Hancock's told the COVID inquiry the nation should have gone into lockdown three weeks earlier than it did. The former health secretary says it would have saved many lives. If we'd had the doctrine that I propose, which is as soon as you know you've got a lockdown, you lock down as soon as possible, then we would have got the lockdown done over that weekend in on the 
2nd of March, three weeks earlier than before. There's a doubling rate at this point estimated every three to four days. We would have been six doublings ahead of where we were, which means that fewer than a tenth of the number of people would have died in the first wave. A world first online fraud charter, charters being launched to tackle digital scams. The Home Secretary met representatives from uh, leading tech companies, uh, including Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat and YouTube, to sign the pledge. The charter will introduce a number of measures to better protect users, including verifying new advertisers and removing fraudulent content quickly. James Cleverly says it's the culmination of a huge amount of work. Working together, we are seeking to achieve what they want, which is a reduction of fraud on their platforms, what we want, which is a reduction of fraud against British people. There's a mutual benefit here. That's why they're working with us. That's why they've engaged with uh, Anthony Brown and the British government. And that's why we are holding this world first signing of uh, a joint work to drive down online uh, fraud. Former Chancellor Alistair Darling has died at the age of 70. Lord Darling served as a cabinet minister under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown for 13 years, becoming chancellor in 2007. He guided the country through the global financial crisis and remained in the post until Mr Brown lost the election in 2010. The former prime minister's honoured his colleagues, saying Alistair Darling was more than a seasoned politician. I think we've also got to remember he was a great family man. His partnership with Maggie is something that uh, was quite a wonderful uh, thing to see. And of course, he had huge pride, rightly so, in the achievements of his son Callum and his daughter Anna. And my thoughts are with this family uh, who are suffering very much today. Shane McGowan, the front man of the Pogues, has died at the age of 65. He was discharged from hospital last week after being diagnosed with encephalitis. The singer, who was born on Christmas Day, is best known for the 1987 hit fairy tale of New York. Elvis Costello once bet the Irishman he couldn't write a Christmas hit, while McGowan promptly wrote and performed one of the most cherished festive songs. He died peacefully with his wife by his side. RMT members have voted overwhelmingly to accept a deal to end their long-running dispute over paying conditions. It's understood to include a backdated pay rise of 5% for last year and a guarantee that no compulsory redundancies will be made until the end of next year. Train drivers represented by the ASLEF union, though, are still set to strike. Mick Lynch, the General Secretary of the RMT, says it proves that sustained strike action gets results. And as the cold snap sets in, some parts of the UK could see up to 10 centimetres of snow overnight. It's already swept across south-west England, parts of Yorkshire, the north east and Scotland. And the bad news, or good, depending on how you feel about snow, more is expected to come. Uh, yellow weather warnings have been issued across large parts of the UK. Temperatures expected to drop well below freezing. And the warnings are in place for uh, parts of Scotland, England and Northern Ireland until 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. So wrap up warm. This is GB News. We're on TV, digital radio and on your smart speaker too. Now it's over to Michelle. Thanks for that, Aaron. And you've uh, ended by putting a smile on my face at the thoughts of snow. I've got my sledges ordered and I can't wait. I hope it does start to settle and we can get out there. Uh, but I know that a lot of people don't like the snow. So wherever you are, it's very cold. Uh, and I hope you are indeed keeping warm and looking after yourselves. I am Michelle Dubry with you till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, I've got the columnist and broadcaster, Peter Hitchens, and the writer and co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. Good evening, uh, Good evening. gentlemen. Good evening. Also, as well, I shall take a quick second to say congratulations Congratulations to Aaron, who very recently uh, became a father. What a beautiful gift. Best job in the world. So congratulations Bless from you. me, Thank you very much, GB Michelle. News, and of course, all of my audience, I am sure. And you know the drill, don't you, on this programme? It's not just about us three. It's very much about you guys at home as well. What's on your mind tonight? GB Views at GBNews.com is how you can get hold of me. Or you can tweet me at GB News. It's St Andrew's Day today, so I want to get into all things Scotland in a sec. But before I do, I noticed uh, the talk there, the COVID inquiry in the headlines. What do you make to this COVID inquiry? <clears throat> Very briefly, Peter. I think it should be sent home uh, and wound up. It has no purpose. It's, it's already made its mind up that it's going to say, I can predict it now, that we should have, using that horrible prison phrase that everyone adopted, we should have locked down 
sooner and we, do, we should have locked down harder and we should have locked down longer. That's the only thing they're interested in saying. They're not remotely interested in the possibility the whole thing was a mistake. And if anybody comes before them who might be tending in that direction, they won't listen to them. And th that's really all that one can say about it. There is absolutely no point in this inquiry continuing. We know what it'll say and what it will say will be extremely damaging. It is as if what happened in Sweden had never happened at all. A uh, country which didn't plunge into this ridiculous panic and which had better results than we did. Aaron? I think an inquiry is a wise thing to do, but it's already cost more than £100 million. It's predicted to go beyond the Savile inquiry, which was £195 million. How on earth do you spend that much money on some lawyers compiling reports and cross-examining people? I don't quite understand. £200 million. I mean, it's almost like there should be an inquiry into the inquiry. Uh, and, of course, when you get to that point, you probably, like Peter says, give up. What do you guys make to it at home? Do you follow the COVID inquiry? Do you want answers? Do you think it is a waste of time? Do you actually think that whatever the outcome is, do you think lessons actually will be learned? And should there be another pandemic, do you actually think uh, that lessons will be learned and things will change going forward? I've got to say, I don't. And that key question of should we have locked down in the first place does indeed seem to be not getting the focus uh, that perhaps it deserves. We haven't heard, of course, yet from Boris Johnson. That one will be popcorn, won't it, when that happens? Anyway, it is St Andrew's day today. So if you're Scottish, hello, are you having a good day? I want to therefore focus on that neck of the woods because there's a few things going on that I couldn't help but notice. The SNP, for example, seem to be getting an absolute battering uh, in most of the polls at the moment, predicted uh, to get a big kicking from the Labour Party also as well. You might have noticed the Alba Party today proposing, Alex Salmond uh, Party of course, proposing uh, their ideas and plans for what they want to see happen when it comes to giving uh, Holyrood Scottish Parliament more powers uh, when it comes to having perhaps another referendum on Scottish independence. Now, start wherever you want, SNP or the new powers uh, potentially or aspirational powers for another independence referendum, Peter. Well, first thing to note is the absolutely astonishing achievement of the SNP in becoming a, a serious political party out of virtually nothing as it was uh, d during most of my life, and then becoming the accepted government of Scotland. And uh, to imagine that somehow or other it's just going to fade away because of a few opinion polls seems to me to be unlikely. I'm not a Scottish nationalist, uh, though I can absolutely see why people are and why they would think uh, that independence might be a, a good route to take. And I, I, I understand the impulse uh, very strongly. Anybody who who's never felt that the desire for national independence has got something wrong with them. I'm just not sure it's practical myself. I'm not, I'm not as many uh, English Conservatives are bitterly against them. I see their point, and I also don't see any point at all in having a United Kingdom whose members are compelled to belong to it. If people don't want to belong to this country, then they, 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 they should be permitted to leave. But we should also always say, if they do leave, that they will be welcomed back at any time and keep a light burning. Those are, those are my positions on it. I don't think at the moment that they're going through a good time because they've had the catastrophe uh, which can befall any party of internal division. And they've lost, uh, first of all, a, in, in Alex Salmon, probably the cleverest political leader in, in these islands of modern times first. And then Nicola Sturgeon, who uh, was not inspiring, but certainly seemed to keep the, the, the ship on an even keel, has now gone. And so there's a feeling of rudderlessness. And Labour, of course, is, is, is very likely uh, to, be, to be successful in the coming national general election. So the opinion polls will probably show a kind of tribal rush back towards Labour. But whether it means the end of Scottish nationalism, I think I wouldn't... I, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't hold your breath, I, Aaron. I wouldn't be too sure. Where are you on it? I think Peter's made a very lucid argument there. I, I think Scotland is moving to a two-party system. The point is the two parties are Labour and the SNP. Uh, we have something of a winner-takes-all approach in this country with our electoral system. Uh, so, you know, there are some polls out there putting the SNP 10 points above Labour, not many, there's one or two. They would still actually keep most of their seats. There are others where, like you say, it would be a catastrophe for the SNP, and that seems to be the, the direction of travel. I think what Peter says is absolutely spot on. With Alex Salmon and Nicola Sturgeon, you had two era-defining politicians. You're very lucky as a political party to have one. Uh, they had two in quick succession. The question is now, do they have the personnel to carry that on? Statistically improbable. But to finish, I think what Peter said about Scottish nationalism being here for the long term is absolutely correct. Most young Scots yep. 
support nationalism, they support national independence. The question is, will they be the future bureaucrats, orators, policymakers, intellectuals, journalists, uh, driving this agenda forward? And so I think, look, Labour probably will win most seats up there next year. But if Labour don't perform in the four or five years after that, the SNP will be waiting in the wings. So I can't see the Conservatives coming back as a force in Scotland anytime soon. There's another reason for the eclipse of Scottish nationalism, which is nationalism in the United Kingdom has been hugely promoted, or was hugely promoted, by our membership of the European Union, which encouraged the breakup of its member nations into regions and, and sub-nations, and, and actually, I think, w was, was more than happy for it to take place. And the, the sort of independence that Scotland could have dreamt of under Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon would be an independence within the European Union, which would actually be a transfer of dependence from London to Brussels and not independence at all. Now they can't realistically mm. uh, expect to join the European Union. I, I, I don't know whether this is even workable. I think people instinctively see a difficulty here and a roadblock. So I have a feeling that the, the there is another crisis coming for this country over its relations with the European Union, possibly 10 years hence. Uh, but I think whatever happens in Scotland will be mixed up with that. Do you agree with that? Is that fair? I think that's right. And I think Peter's correct that Brexit, initially, so many Scottish nationalists thought this is manna from heaven for us. But actually, it's made their job that bit more difficult. An independent Scotland, what currency would it now have? It wouldn't have the pound, presumably, although the SNP's position is they would initially. Would it have the euro? Well, if you're not in the EU, how will you have the euro? It's a, it's a real mess. And I think Peter's right that the, the roadblocks at present are entirely practical. Currency, central bank, pensions. Mm. I think most people who even don't agree with national independence say Scotland is a nation, it has a history, it has a people, it has its own... Um, uh, legal and political bodies up in Scotland, that's fine. We want them to have more powers. The question is how far do you go with that? I, I also don't know about the next steps here because Labour, most likely over the next sort of four or five years, would delegate more powers to Edinburgh um, and Cardiff as well and, and possibly Northern Ireland too. And the argument would be, well, this will pacify and mitigate that nationalist impulse. But, of course, the experience of the last 20 years is all that does is really fan the flames. Yeah, and I was listening to uh, Penny Morden as well. She was speaking out. I mean, she really wasn't pulling any punches uh, in Parliament. I don't know if you heard this today. Uh, a reminder if you missed it. The SNP really have surpassed themselves this week uh, in terms of being self-obsessed, self-pitying and self-delusional. The SNP are losing the case for independence. But despite uh, the uh, Scottish Government being one of the most powerful devolved administrations in the world, it can't accept responsibility for anything. Given that they have been in power for 16 years and every single one of those years their budget has been 20 per cent higher than England, who does she think it is that is responsible for Scotland's declining A&E performance, increased waiting times, 70 per cent hike in drug-related deaths, 10 per cent increase in the attainment gap? The 10 years they've been missing their cancer targets and their housing targets, or rising crime, or soaring violence in schools, or the lowest police numbers since 2008. I can tell you now, right, that went on and on and on. What was you about to say? It sounds well, like what? It sounds like England. I mean, well, it's, it's well, a bit of a strange thing to attack a Scottish politician for that. You might want to look in your own backyard. I think carrying that sword around may have gone to her head, do you think? Well, I, when I was listening to that, I do think... Um, that sometimes politicians, because I will often say that to um, when people are here and they're representing the Tories, for example, and I will say to them, when you're describing things, it's been on your watch. It's been on your watch that lots of things have declined. So I do think uh, that was a very passionate attack there, but also the irony uh, of what's gone on in this country while the Tories have presided over it seems to be lost. Uh, also, as well, I uh, can't not mention uh, Scotland without mentioning that Alistair Dallin, of course, uh, very sad news today of his passing. He was very prominent uh, in the Better Together campaign as well, wasn't he, in 2014, of course, yeah. uh, as well as being our former Chancellor. Which was odd, considering that it was his party which had really created the whole, uh, the, the whole crisis in the first place. I remember going to Edinburgh once for some debate and him saying to me as I walked into the room, welcome uh, to our country. And I said, I thought I was already in our country. Uh, but the, 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 the Labour was very mixed up uh, with nationalism in its in its early stages, thinking that it, by, by by feeding the beast it would uh, it would quell it, and I think it came as a considerable surprise to them that what they had actually done was they had created a real a real risk 
of Scottish national independence and, of course, their own destruction north of the border, which very nearly took place. I mean, they're recovering from it a bit now, but they were wiped out. Mm. And, I mean, tributes have really been pouring in, especially from the Labour Party, of course, for Alistair Darling. Your experience of him, thoughts of him? Well, it should be said that him and Gordon Brown came in for a lot of flack, particularly Gordon Brown, um, towards the tail end of the new Labour government. But uh, they did oversee a major existential crisis for this country in the 2007-2008 uh, financial crash. And I do wonder if the, the politicians we've had since then, if somebody like a, a Johnson or a Theresa May or a Rishi Sunak, if they'd been at the helm, or even David Cameron, how different would things have been? That's an open question. Maybe I'm being very unfair. But I think, actually, the further time that passes since 2008, the more obvious it is to me, at least, that they did a half-decent job. What do you think society would be like uh, if those people were at the helm? Would it have been better? Would it be sitting here now in a better position or worse? Let me know all of your thoughts. I've got a lot coming up in the programme. Uh, Lucy Letby, apparently she's been moved uh, to a prison, I think. It sounds like quite a nice place. And I'm asking, do you think prisons are a little bit too cushy these days? Also, as well, I'm asking, uh, the war, the situation now in Gaza, is this now affecting the safety here on British streets? I would uh, suggest it is. Are you OK at the moment? Do you feel safe? Are we doing enough, do you think, to keep people safe on the streets of Britain? You tell me. I'll see you in two. Who is it? We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories. Which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper. We've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomney Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Could you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? It's your new teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
Hi there, I'm Michelle Juby with you till seven. The columnist broadcaster Peter Hitchens alongside me, as is the writer and co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani. Lots of you guys getting in touch. Uh, I asked you briefly at the start of the programme what you make to the COVID inquiry. Long story short, uh, pretty much all of you that have got in touch are telling me you think it's a waste of time, effort and money. Uh, Mary says, hindsight is a wonderful thing. At the end of the day, Michelle, nobody knew what they were doing or how to deal with it. It all now just looks like a blame game, desperate uh, to try and find a scapegoats. Is there anyone out there that thinks the complete opposite, that perhaps this is an inquiry that's desperately needed and that you do indeed trust that it's going to uncover all the right information and that lessons will be learned and things will be done differently? If you exist, get in touch and tell me. I'm fascinated to hear why. Uh, right, it's a big story I want to discuss with you tonight. We all know, of course, the situation uh, in the Israel-Gaza conflict. But I'm asking tonight specifically about how that is impacting here on the streets of Britain, because apparently, uh, according to security sources, is the terror threat level uh, has recently been raised in France and Belgium following separate attacks there. Uh, we've got a situation where, uh, according to one report, half of British Jews have said that they've considered leaving the UK uh, due to a rise in anti-Semitism. And uh, security source has been talking to us at GB News as well, uh, saying that they believe a terror attack in the UK linked to the conflict in Gaza is likely only a matter of time. Goodness me. Um, Peter Hitchens, what do you make some of this? Well, what do all these things mean? I, I have no idea. I, I, I live on the basis that it's quite possible there could be a terrorist attack of some kind in this country at any time. Uh, but I doubt very much whether it would have, uh, it would have a direct link with events of, of this sort. Also, there's a great tendency in this country to mischaracterize uh, e events of horrible violence as terrorists, when in fact, when you examine them, they turn out to be uh, people with, uh, with serious mental problems, generally following drug abuse, running amok, who are then classified as terrorists, uh, in, in my view, mistakenly. And we're, we're all told that, we're sp that, that this is some kind of terrorist. They don't make a sense as terrorist attacks, many of these events. The people who, who, who actually commit them don't really know what they're doing. Uh, the acts themselves couldn't conceivably advance any cause that, that, that these people might possibly espouse. Uh, they make no sense. They're not part of any coordinated campaign. There is a tendency in this country to exaggerate the existence and the nature of terror. So say it can't happen or won't happen. It might well happen, but I, 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 I doubt very much the capacity of our vaunted security services uh, to know if they're going to happen. I think these, these, these are vast and expensive organisations, almost completely immune from any kind of examination, uh, are, do have some reason to, how shall I put this, um, advocate their own existence by, by, by spreading uh, material of this sort. But I think we should be a bit more sceptical about it, honestly. You, 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 to the extent that people can prepare for terrorist actions, we should prepare for them. But half the point of terrorism to make us frightened. And if we spend all our time being frightened without even being attacked, then, I, then we are very much doing the job of the terrorists, aren't we? Mm, I'm surprised that you don't think that the actions um, in Gaza would make people or certain uh, people do something on the streets in their well, name. I don't see the logical link between the two. Why, why, why would that because be Because people don't appreciate um, innocent people in Palestine having bombs rained down on their head 24-7 and they would expect the governments here uh, or the government here to be pushing back and trying to do something to stop that activity and they would perhaps hold this government accountable, directly accountable, for not doing that, I would imagine. Honestly, Britain has really quite a small influence over these matters in any case. Uh, it would, if there were international terrorist bodies thinking of taking action over this, which there might be, uh, I don't really see why Britain would be at the top of their list. I don't think it'd be international activities, but I think lone wolves or whatever they call. But anyway, let me bring you in, Bast uh, I, I called you Bastani well, then. Why not? Aaron, bring uh, for your thoughts. It's almost like school. Um, I, I, think that's, I think that's right to an extent. I think it would be more individuals, lone wolves. I don't think anybody's saying, I don't think anybody seriously is saying that Hamas or Hezbollah have a wing operating in the UK against the IRA during the Troubles. Uh, Organised. It's a new thing on me if they do. Ideologically yeah. coherent, precisely, well equipped. I think there probably is a, a slightly greater chance of something like that happening because so many individuals who are very atomized perhaps have a sense of grievance and they would obviously be doing something appalling with it. But like you say, Michelle, the context is things are happening in Europe, so maybe it's more plausible. What's more interesting to me is actually this question about British Jews being scared. Because as somebody who's from a minority, I'm half Iranian, I have to say, Britain is one of the best countries in the world to not be from the majority culture. My view. 
Um, to not be white British, you can still do a tremendous amount in this country. You can have a great life, you can get on, you can have a family, you can be left alone, you can think and do what you want, broadly speaking. And I find it very puzzling that so many people in this country who say they love this country, care for this country, respect this country, and I'm not talking about British Jews, I'm talking about commentators discussing this, say they're all scared, they're all in fear, and that's because this is such an awful country which doesn't look after minorities. That simply isn't true. Now, do those same people have legitimate, justified concerns about what's happening? Of course they do. But I think there's a bit of overkill going on if all of a sudden we're saying that for minorities, for Jewish people, or somebody else might say for black people or for Iranian people, Britain is this awful place to be, and that, that simply is not the case. I don't think... We're very Aaron, tolerant, uh, we're very fair, and I think we're very just. I don't think, Aaron, that's what's being said. I think what's well, being said it, is, you know. is, 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 is that Jews in this country are... Uh, are increasingly nervous about their position, and there's reason from history for Jews to be nervous when when people start uh, shouting anti-Semitic slogans in the street for the, them to wonder where this might end. It might end with nothing, or it might end with something quite serious. And so you you can't really ever dismiss that. I'm not, no, 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 that's a good word. I'm not dismissing it. When you see the scenes, for instance, in Dagestan, that is somewhere where sure. you have a, a, a bone deep. My, my, um, my grandmother's from quite close to there. She's no. from about 100, 150 miles south of there. She's Jewish. Down by, by, the, heritage. Cas down by the Caspian. She's, yeah, Azari Jew. So, yeah. you know, that is somewhere where you go, wow, that's pretty extraordinary to see. But I also think we do need to take... I'm not dismissing those concerns. It's a really important point you make. I'm not dismissing those concerns. You do have to take a step back and say, is Britain still a tolerant country, which is very fair, honest and just to people from the non-majority culture, to minorities? Yes, it is. I'm not dismissing anyone, but I think some perspective is needed. Yeah, but hold on, because that's all well and good in normal times, yeah. but these are not normal times. There is a conflict going on, as we've just been discussing, um, and, the, you know, we've just seen some scenes on there. So just to give you some context for this, so this is um, the campaign against anti-Semitism. What they're saying, uh, there's been a 1,300% increase in anti-Semitism. Uh, they're saying that they have done a survey of British Jews, which has shown us that nearly 69% six, uh, or almost 70% of British Jews are saying that they are now less likely to show visible signs of their duties. Uh, apparently, this uh, same survey says that half of British Jews have considered whether or not they need to leave the UK due to anti-Semitism. <coughs> so, whilst I agree with what you're saying, if life was normal, life is not currently normal in a lot of ways. You've got these big uh, pro-Palestine marches happening every single weekend. You've got people within those marches that are very anti-Semitic. You've got people mm. wandering the streets Absolutely. Uh, with Hamas-style headbands on. You've got um, Nazi symbols on placards. So these are not normal times. So in, those, in these times, I find it quite staggering that you would think that a lot of British Jews wouldn't be terrified. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it is still a fantastic place to not be from the majority culture, and I think we forget that. Yeah, but that's no consolation, is it? If you've got people well, on the streets chanting for your for your death, pretty much, if you're Jewish. So let's 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 look at a few points you, you've made in terms of the campaign against anti-Semitism. I think this is my personal view. Israel has a position, an, an understandable position, where they really want as many European Jews to go back to Israel as possible for two reasons. Firstly. Um, it is their country, it's their homeland. Secondly, because of demographic concerns that there aren't simply enough Israelis to maintain this country going forward. And that has been a strategic long-term imperative for Israel that we would, we'd like European Jewry to come back to Israel, to return to Israel, to do Aliyah. Right. That's one part. And I think, to some extent, there is an intentional desire and motivation to instill fear in European Jews as a result. Now... Are European Jews at Hell, the same time... On whose part? I think certain interest groups. I think certain ultra-nationalist interest groups in Israel want to encourage as many European Jews to go to Israel as possible. That's my... Mm. I, I mean, I've read about that. That's what I've learned. At the same time, you clearly have a massive increase in anti-Semitism across Europe. You have the targeting of Jewish people, not just in Europe, but also in North America, too. And I think, actually, the solution is... I don't know if you want to talk about this, because there was this awful story in East London... Mm. where they won't be putting out the menorah for Christmas. Which yeah, is just, I've seen that, yeah, yeah. Which is just appalling. Well, it's, it, it is atrocious, and, it's, and, 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 and what whoever's what... taken this decision uh, should, should retake it and reverse it's it. It's disgusting. Well, it's giving in to... It, it, it's giving in, essentially, to menace. Can I just... Uh, yeah, I'll just say, what do. the story is, for people who aren't aware, 
you've got this menorah every year in Havering, East London. It goes out during the, the sort of uh, the festive period. I say that because, of course, it's not Christmas, it's uh, Hanukkah. Um, it, it goes out over the festive period. And uh, they aren't doing it this year because there are worries that it will be damaged, destroyed, God knows what. Now, they're saying they don't want to inflame community tensions. Mm. Well, I think that's absolutely appalling because, look, when little black children wanted to go to all-white schools in Alabama in the 1950s, that inflamed community tensions. The point is those communities were wrong. So I think there's, 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 there's a twofold approach here for me, um, Michelle. On the one hand, British Jews should be absolutely proud of what and who they are. They should absolutely not be intimidated by what's going on. There absolutely is a rise in anti-Semitism. Of course, what's going on in Havering is appalling. We need political leadership which doesn't cow to these kinds of impulses. But I do really want to remind our viewers, Britain remains a tolerant, generally uh, high-trust, uh, generous and just country. And I, I really do get worried when people keep on doing us down like this. But, but I'm trying to unpick what you're saying because there are a lot of Jewish people I know as well because a lot of people get in touch with this programme, so I do speak to people every day about this. And a lot of Jewish people are frightened. A lot of... You know, you see um, there was that school the other day, that Jewish school where it's got all this red paint chucked on it mm. and all the rest of it, and people are afraid. Mm. And people will see this chant from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free. People will interpret that chant as meaning a one-state solution, which basically means the eradication uh, of Jewish people in and around those areas, We're talking about two separate things here, though, aren't we? We're talking about... Well, not really. Well, no, we are. No, 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 not, not really, yeah, because it's, 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 in this well, atmosphere, it's in this atmosphere, particularly the atmosphere of the, 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 um, the demonstrations, which have been repeated very unusually. I can't think of any other occasion where a demonstration for a cause has been repeated weekly on the streets of the capital over and over again. Well, I can. Student uh, demonstrations, I participated in them 10 years ago, but yes, it's I think it's, it's not, really, not really parallels. And I think that this, this, this has uh, undoubtedly created particular worry. And the, 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 sort of, the sort of incidents which Michelle described of a, of a school being splashed with, with paint and abusive faith, the authorities really do need, it seems to me, to act very strongly against this kind of thing, to detect and charge and prosecute... I completely agree. Uh, ..the culprits in a way... I don't see this happening, and I think there does need to be much more sign uh, from the authorities and the criminal justice system that there are limits which it, it, it simply will not, uh, will not go beyond and things which it simply will not tolerate. I, I haven't seen enough of that. I'm not in favour of stopping people from saying things, but, my right. goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm against people being allowed to get away with, with, uh, with, with throwing pains at Jewish schools and intimidating human beings, and particularly children in that way. That you have to stand up against without reservation. And I, I don't think there's been quite enough of that. Myself, I think which is why I'm worried about this, uh, this, this this decision to take down the, or, or not put up the menorah for, for, for Hanukkah. It just seems to me to be a retreat of ultimately of authority, and authority shouldn't retreat when it sees these things. It should advance. Yeah, and I've got to say, I don't think the two things are separate. To your point, your response to me, I think they're very much. Uh, linked, and I do think that um, it's great if a Jewish person uh, feels safe, absolutely wonderful. I've got nothing against that, but I I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the collection of Jewish people that absolutely don't feel safe and that do feel that people wandering the streets chanting, uh, they would interpret it as a one-state solution, they would interpret meaning basically get rid of all the Jews. That is intimidating no, and no, frightening no, a lot of people. I think, look, these are these are separate. These are separate things. That's the but point. I don't so see if you how want to, you no, but if are. you want to talk about the legitimacy of that and the trade-offs between, but how and are they two separate things? We're well, talking because, about whether or not people feel. Because that's not illegal. Street. That's not illegal. I didn't say it was illegal. No, but throwing red paint at a synagogue or making menaces or. Um, uh, supporting a prescribed terrorist organisation. That is illegal. That but is did, stuff but that... But I'm not saying it's illegal. People... But these are just, separate things, right? You don't right? get intimidated and feel frightened based on what's illegal and what's not. No, but the point is the state can be doing things and it's not doing them, as Peter just said, about this. So I think, why don't we start there and rather than have an abstract conversation about a chant relating to foreign policy decisions about a country see, I, thousands of miles I away? I find this fascinating that you think it's a random abstract. There's no, I, connect, there's no connection between people in their tens of thousands making chants that relate many would It is an abstract debate, though, because it's about freedom of expression versus um, incitement. It is about... That's a, absolutely an abstract debate, whereas somebody throwing red paint on a synagogue is not abstract. They've broken the law. Yeah, you know, I, I don't want to go around in circles, but I, I just feel... Uh, 
and I know I don't just feel it, I know it because I hear people every day getting in contact with me. There's a lot of people feel frightened, they feel afraid uh, when they're seeing those chants and you might not and you might know a lot of people that don't, not, uh, don't feel afraid and that's wonderful but a lot of people do and just because it's not illegal and just because it's within the confines of free speech doesn't mean that that makes people feel any less uh, intimidated or any less uh, unsafe or anything like that. Anyway, I'll throw it up into you guys. I'm sure you have opinions on that. GB Views at GBNews.com. I've got a lot more that I want to rattle through with you. I might, I might revisit this, we'll see, uh, before the end of the programme. But I want to ask you, are, are prisons a little bit too cushy uh, in this country, a little bit too soft? And also, I want to talk to you about the British uh, Asian BBC presenter who says that his mental health is suffering because there are too many white people, basically, uh, where he works. Your thoughts? See you in two. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aqueer, at 3 p.m. every Saturday and Sunday where we discuss the biggest topics of the weekend. Be ready for battle. Can you be quiet? <laughs> what is this? Is it, it, you? <laughs> it's on your teeth. It's your new teeth. I don't bite. Well, not without a good reason. Always honest, always fun. Every weekend at 3 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. Headliners, you don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us 11pm every night on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We're here for the show. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? <laughs> I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Sundays on GB News. Hi there, Michelle Jubri, Aaron Bastani, uh, Peter Hitchens, right through till 7 o'clock with you. There's certain things in life that I wish that I hadn't uh, seen. Nigel Farage's backside in the jungle is one of them. Uh, another one, ladies and gents, is Peter Hitchens uh, on a toilet in a prison cell. Well, wait a minute. You only saw my upper body. Um, well, that was enough. There was movement. Well, I'm not, I know. There was facial expressions I, I have, I, and since we're, since we're entering into this discussion, there was actually no movement at all. There is no more constipating experience in life than sharing a small room with another bloke uh, and having to do everything in public. I promise you. Well, anyway, the reason I mentioned so it, I don't, I don't want to go on about was on this, a, a TV show yeah. uh, called Banged Up or whatever it was. It was all about the state of prisons. I found it interesting today that the, the lady that's been convicted of killing multiple babies, Lucy Letby, you'll be familiar 
familiar with that uh, with that story. I don't need to rehash it. Uh, she apparently has been moved to another prison. And I've got to say, I was taking a look at the prison. I can show you it, actually. I'll show you uh, the front page of their website. It caught my eye today, so it did. Uh, this is HMP Bronzefield. Look at that. The top right-hand side, it says, our aim is to change lives for the better. Shouldn't the aim of prison be to punish people? Not very much so, but not to insult them or humiliate them or, or destroy their souls. Uh, I, you know, prisons should be austere. Uh, they shouldn't be, certainly shouldn't be places of luxury, but I don't, they certainly shouldn't be places where we, we deliberately set out to make people uh, miserable and, and, and humiliated. There would be no point in that. The, the, their places, in, in my view, which is, is no longer the view of the government, by the well, way. Well, there's Peter in prison, Lord. Places, of, see it. places where, where punishment should take place, due punishment of responsible persons who uh, have, have committed uh, crimes against a known law. But uh, so it's, it's not, it's one thing to say you're going to punish someone, it's another thing to say you're going to insult and humiliate them, and I don't believe in doing that. And I, I, they, nobody who's been inside, and I, I haven't just been inside Shrewsbury Prison for, for, for four days in the, in the Bagged Up programme, I've, I've visited many prisons, well, several prisons in, in this country and other parts of the world. Nobody uh, would wish to be inside a prison for a minute longer than they had to be. Uh, with an en suite shower or not. And uh, the, I would not make out that these places are places where anybody could be, uh, could even for a moment, be happy or contented or particularly comfortable. And that's not what they're like. And don't get that into your head. The prisoner's holiday camp argument is, is frankly, not the point. The point is prisons is who runs prisons and what they're for. And at the moment, they're largely run by the inmates and they don't have punishment in them. Very different experience to my teenage years. I used to visit my uh, then boyfriend frequently in prison, uh, and there was many people that I knew back in those days that were in and out of prison like a yo-yo. They seemed to not have any issues spending more minutes than they needed to back inside anyway. Uh, Aaron, your thoughts? I have to say, actually, that it was very good TV with Peter, and he has this interaction with this young man, and I almost see you as being like a... This is not being patronising. Almost as a father figure to him, I think. He clearly is in search of a mentor, and there was just a glimpse of him having that, and he responded so well. Uh, so, you know, maybe you should be doing more... No, Tom, well, Tom, in, uh, in Tom, Tom, Tom and I got on surprisingly well, and, and he asked me to read to him, which was extraordinary. Uh, in fact, we read to each other, and we spent long hours, because, you know, you were banged up together with nothing else to do. We spent long hours telling each other our personal stories, and it was fascinating, I think, certainly for me, I hope for him, and a very interesting experience. I hope Tom will go, will go far. He's a bright... Do you person. stay in touch with him? Uh, not at the moment, no. He's, he's out in the Far East at the moment. But I expect I will be back in touch with him at some point, yes. Yeah, see, there, I, do, I share the kind of sentiment about... I mean, I was looking at the website of this prison. Uh, I've got to say, I was reading it. I thought it sounds all right, actually, the prison that she was in, en suite. Um, you've got, they've got a creche in there, an Ofsted-rated outstanding creche, got a lovely play area as well. Uh, people would argue, well, children shouldn't be in prisons. I completely agree. Uh, but the answer for that, then, is that the mothers shouldn't really be committing crimes, then, should they? Um, anyway, what do you make to prisons? Do you think uh, that whole notion of our aim is to kind of make people uh, better people and all the rest of it, is that the primary responsibility of a prison in your, in your view? GBviews at gbnews.com. When I come back after the break, I'll bring some of your thoughts into the show, but also, I'm asking you, there's a British uh, Asian BBC presenter who says that actually the fact that he works with majority white people is affecting his mental health. What do you make to that? See you in two. You know, I've been a pop star. I've been a TV presenter. I've danced on Strictly. I faced some of my biggest fears on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to face my biggest challenge of all by joining GB News with Ellie Costello <laughs> and Peter Rambo. For the brightest start to your weekend with all the news, the biggest stories, plus some special guests. Join me, Peter Andre. And me, Ellie Costello, for Saturday Morning Live from 10. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Wake up to the headlines with Headliners every morning at 5am. We treat you to the day's biggest stories before anyone else, seven days a week. You can catch up on everything you need to know before you've even had your kippers. Mmm. 
Headliners every morning at 5am, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens with our team of dedicated journalists across the UK. We're ready to give you accurate reporting every day. When the news breaks, we'll be there with bulletins on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. GB News, unlike other broadcasters, isn't obsessed with the London Westminster bubble. We think there's a nation beyond the M25, and that's why we talk about the issues that matter across the land. Join me on State of the Nation, 8 to 9 o'clock, Monday to Thursday, on GB News. Daisy's listening, and you should too. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested, pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9.30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomney Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubri and I'm with you till 7 o'clock. Aaron Bastani and Peter Hitchens remain alongside me now. A story that caught my eye, BBC Radio 5 live presenter, uh, Nihal Arfa Nikaya, I think that's how I pronounce it, apologies if I've done that wrong, uh, says that an overwhelmingly white working environment is affecting his mental health. Um, I want to just cut straight to the chase uh, on this one because... The thing that jumps out at this for me is if anyone said this in a different way, so say, like, for example, I worked in an environment that was predominantly, um, I don't know, black people. If I said, oh, I come to work every day and it's majority black people, mm. I mean, all hell would break loose, quite mm. frankly, mm. and understandably so. Mm. But this has not had any kind of pushback whatsoever. In fact, it's created a conversation about the need to be more diverse. Mm. It's... Ridiculous what he said, frankly. I mean, I, I do actually wonder if he believes what he said. You know, sometimes people say things to a small room of people that haven't actually thought about what they're saying. Um, so, you know, a brief synthesis. He's worked in London for about 20 years. He now lives in Salford because, of course, BBC have outsourced many of their jobs there. And he says when he goes into work, um, like you say, he has so many white colleagues there, he sees so few brown and black people, presumably it's different in London, it's giving him mental health issues. Look, this country is 80% white. You know, if you have a problem walking into a room full of white people, uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be in trouble. He does say something else, however, which is interesting, which is that he said he's been exposed to the P-word more frequently in Salford than in London. And I wonder, you know, has he had a negative experience like that? Uh, and it's, it's shaped these views, which I think are obviously wrong. And they're also deeply insulting to his colleagues. I mean, imagine if you're one of his colleagues, you say, morning. And you think, was, am I one of the, the bad white people that he's referring to? Yeah, because um, so he was saying this basically at an event and he said that um, it was really affecting me. This is a direct quote. It's really affecting me that I walk in and all I see is white people. His colleague's response uh, when he's told them that this was to reply defensively, uh, saying that they were not being racist. And he says that that was basically uh, missing the point. What do you make some of this, Peter? Well, I too was disturbed by the mention of the P word being used, and I thought maybe there was there was only half the story being told. 
and that his complaint might be actually rather different from the one that, that, uh, that he's been more publicised as making. If people are doing that, if he is encountering more of that, then that is obviously a serious matter. Uh, the other thing, and we do... We, it, 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 is, it is, of course, the case that you know, there is a majority culture in this country and there are minority cultures. And being a, a member of the majority culture, I tend to be pretty complacent about things like this, so I'll try not to be. Uh, the, the, the other thing, and it, leaving aside the P word issue, which is obviously very serious, if so, uh, that worries me about is this use, and this isn't directed just at this person uh, or even particularly at him at all, but in general, the use of the phrase mental health. Uh, to describe uh, to, to describe someone who's distressed, to say it's affecting my mental health. Now you can say you're unhappy, you can say you're distressed, you can say that you're angry, uh, you can you, you can you can say all kinds of things about your state. But to turn everything into an issue of health and mental health seems to me to be dangerous. And there is a huge tendency in this country, in many many areas of life, to medicalise unhappiness and to medicalise distress, which I don't think is good for any of the people involved. And I think we should be much more sceptical of it than we are. Uh, quite large numbers of people, for instance, in my view, are taking so-called medications, uh, either for things such as alleged ADHD uh, or alleged depression, uh, which are very powerful drugs. And there is actually no objective uh, diagnosis of the things for which these things are being prescribed. And it's a major problem, and it needs to be discussed. And the use of the word mental health to, to describe distress seems to me to be a step towards this happening more, not less. Yeah, and I mean, it's uh, the pushback to this is we're sitting here pretty much as three white people saying that... I'm, I'm mixed heritage. There you go, Michelle. We've got permission to talk about it. There you go. But then You, you have. Yeah. But well, then... no, no, we have... <laughs> But then maybe, because then the flip side to this would be then we're sitting here and we don't experience that experience, so who are we to sit there and say, you know, trivialise that sentiment and that feeling? That's true, but also there were other statements... That's true. And, look, I, I think it is... Sometimes it's unfair because you say something to a room, like I say, you don't mean it or it's misinterpreted. It's, it's not fair, but, you know, these are the kinds, of, the kinds of conversations that really get people going. What I would say is I don't need somebody to look like me I think they're doing a great job. I must say, uh, neither do I. Um, uh, yeah, if everyone looked, if everyone looked like all of us, I mean, what would you make to that? But yeah, look, but I think there's also um, a question of him. Make it a very quick question. Moving away question. from something he was used to to something he wasn't used to by moving from one part of the country to another. And things do differ in different parts mm. of the country. Uh, well, there you go. What do you make to it all? Uh, anyway, look, that's all we've got time for. F time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Aaron, thank you for your company. Peter, thank you yours, for yours. Thank you. And likewise, thank you at home. Have a good night, and I will see you tomorrow night. night. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update from the Met Office. Friday is going to be another dry day for many of us, but it will be feeling very cold once again, with potentially some freezing fog to start and some snow showers. We've seen snow as a result of this frontal system bumping into the cold air across parts of the southwest. That will clear away throughout the course of the night, but it will leave with it some a risk of ice on the roads across parts of Devon and Cornwall. There's also a risk of some ice across the northeast of England. England, as well as many eastern areas of Scotland as a result of the snow showers. You could also see some icy stretches across parts of Northern Ireland. So there'll be another very cold start tomorrow morning. It could be as low as minus 7, minus 8 once again. There'll also be some freezing fog patches across many central and eastern areas. These could be quite slow to clear. There'll also be some showers starting to come in across parts of Suffolk. We could see some sleetiness within this as well. But for many of us, it will be a dry day with some winter sunshine, but temperatures still really struggling, two or three degrees at best in many places. And then Saturday is going to start on a very cold note. We could be down as low as minus double digits. Some crisp sunshine to be had, mostly across northeastern areas this time, uh, with showers moving in from the west. These showers could fall as snow over the high ground of Wales and potentially across central areas as well. But things turn somewhat less cold early next week. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. We're here for the show.
Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese. <laughs> I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour.